Well, good morning. morning. Sorry. (laughs) Get run down by form. Um, (laughs) uh, Tim and Shelley are currently in New York City. I spoke to them on Friday morning. They were driving through New Jersey on their way to New York. They had a great time in Washington, D.C., except one of the three things that Tim wanted to do, he couldn't do because, and that was visit the Museum of the Bible because apparently the construction took a little longer, so it didn't open in September, it opens in November now. So he wasn't able to do that. I guess he'll just have to go back another time. So um, hopefully things won't get too busy next week because I got a jury summons while he's away. (laughs) So and it's the first one I've had as a US citizen, so I can't just check the box (laughs) and send it back. So now I actually have to do something about it, which is a shame. (laughs) Anyway. Okay, announcements. Harvest of Blessings. There are tickets for sale in the pavilion for that. They are $30, and um, it says on here we now take credit cards. Well, we would, except we're having problems with the credit card machine, (laughs) as usual. So we might not be taking credit cards today. Uh, We'll try again in between services. But... uh, So there's only 250 spots for that, so if you do want tickets, get them early so they don't run out. Um, It's only, well, it's at the end of this month. So it's October already, it's October 1st, which is great. Where does time go? Um, Prime timers, 55 and over, not coming Tuesday, but next Tuesday. There is the normal uh, prime timers luncheon, 12 o'clock, potluck style. Um, come to that if you're over 55. There is also a concert in here at uh, 1 o'clock, and that is a concert with four girls who are two sets of twins called the Gilly Girls, and they do kind of a bluegrass southern gospel style. Do we have video on that? Oh. Okay, so we'll watch a video on that. So that's at 1 o'clock in here after the seniors luncheon, and we're going to see a quick clip on see what they are like. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big hand and welcome the Gilly Girls. Bring a little one. My name is Savannah and I'm 13. I'm Morgan and I'm also 13. I'm Haley and I'm 11. I'm Jillian and I'm also 11. Some talent right there, it's amazing. So we have for that at one o'clock, um, so we could choose, there's a sign-up sheet here for the Giddy Girls concert, so we'll pass that around. That's on the second page. Uh, on the first page, there is, this will be the last time that we send this around, that is for Man Camp. Man Camp is October 20th through the 22nd. Um, this is just an opportunity for guys from the church to get together and go up to the mountains at Shaver Lake, at Edison Campground. And do whatever you want to do. There's no particular pressure. There's no, it's not a retreat. It's just a 20 minute devotional time, Friday night, um, Saturday night, there'll be a wilderness service is what we call it. It'll be out on the grassland behind where we're camping. Uh, And that will be some worship, a sermon, but it won't last more than 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, And then the rest of the time is all yours. So you can go fishing, you can go hiking, hang out at camp, whatever it is you want to do. There's no pressure from anybody. The food is all provided, it's $25. Um, which is a steal for camping and for all the food for the weekend. And then Sunday, come back down. I'll be back in time for service, but you can hang up there until middle of the day, whatever you like. So uh, it's a fun time. So there's a sign-up sheet for that. If you want to go to that, sign up. If you 
decide later on, that's fine too, we'll fit you in. Uh, we just need to be able to figure out how much food we need and stuff like that. Uh, what else we got? We have Prison Fellowship, the No More Blues Closet. The No More Blues um, part of Prison Fellowship is to do with giving clothing to people coming out of prison so that they can have what they need, especially for things like job interviews where they need to wear nicer clothes, they don't necessarily have that. So um, they accept donations of clothes at any time. Also, they have an open house on October 15th, so if you want to go along and learn more about what they do there and see, see their operation, uh, that would be worthwhile. Also, some calendar items, October 15th, October 21st is Widow's Lunch Bunch, They're getting together twice this month. So uh, those are on the, in the bulletin if you want details on that. And then the New Hope Kids musical uh, is also, it's starting today, the rehearsals at 10.45, they do that the third service. It's not too late to join if you have kids that want to join, uh, generally elementary school kids, but we also junior high, high school as well, if they want to be in it, I'm sure we can find a part for them. Um, should be a lot of fun, it's kind of a Christmas parade style, it's, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, marching up and, down the, up and down the sanctuary, it should be a lot of fun, and there's some great songs in it, a lot of songs, so... Um, if your kids want to participate in that, or you want them to, <laughs> then there's a big difference sometimes. Uh, <laughs> then it's not too late to sign up for that. Um, also, the Neonan kids, are still, we still have the board up here, so the junior high kids from Neonan in the Ivory Coast, there's still an opportunity to sponsor them. Uh, if it has a sticker on it with a happy face, it means they're already sponsored. If you would like to sponsor one, just write your name on the, in the little gap underneath the, their name, uh, and then we will contact you about how that works. It may not be until after Shelley gets back, but so there's still plenty of opportunity to do sponsorship uh, on that side. Um, I think that is about all the announcements we've got. Uh, so we'll get into some prayer requests. Um, the first one I want to bring to your attention, Laurie Bridgham, who goes to our eight o'clock service. Many of you will know her. She does volunteering in preschool uh, in the kids or in the toddler room in the kids' uh, building. She also does volunteer for funerals and stuff like that. Um, her husband passed away on Friday, unexpectedly. He was found at work, um, so she is dealing with that right now. Her family is dealing with that, so um, please keep them in your prayers. Very important. It's very, very difficult with sudden things happen so unexpectedly like that. Very, very difficult to deal with. So, you know, families gathering together. We will do what we can this coming week. Uh, for her, but definitely pray for her and her family, pray for strength for them. Um, also, Valerie Martinez, uh, not associated, or not, come, doesn't come to our church, but associated with somebody that does come, so we're asking prayers for her. Um, she has illness that is getting progressively worse, so Valerie Martinez, and then Candice Smith is uh, contact through the Weldy family who come to our church, we're asking for prayers for her. Uh, she has illness as well. That is uh, not good at this point. So um, please keep those families in your prayers uh, this coming week. Uh, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward for our tithes and offerings. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the season. Now we're, October is cooler and in the mornings and we're just grateful for the shift in, in seasons. And Along with changes of seasons come changes in people's lives. And uh, We pray for the Bridgham family this morning as they deal with um, the loss of, of Stephen and we just pray that they will lean on you for strength and for understanding. Uh, we pray safety of travel for the family that are coming together uh, at this difficult time. But Lord, we just pray for the resources, and we thank you for the, the resources that you give us. Um, so many people called the church to let us know about Stephen's death, and we just, we're just grateful that our church family is that close, that so many people are concerned enough that, to let us know. Uh, we're thankful for this fellowship. It's a close one, and people know that, and people understand that, and it's a resource that people can use, and we're thankful for that. Lord, as this busy season starts, or continues, we just pray for clarity of mind as we go through it. Uh, we thank you for all of the activities that we get to do, the resources that we have. And we just pray that we are good stewards of all the resources that you provide to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. 
One thing I forgot to mention in the announcements is Sunday night church. So we have Sunday night church every Sunday now at 6 p.m. in the bridge. Uh, this evening, Steve Brown's going to preach. It'll be a first of two parts. We're continuing our look at the early church, book of Acts, and um, Steve's going to be uh, preaching about Stephen, interesting enough. So that's a good subject for Steve. Um, also tonight, we have a Turkish pastor who's going to be at the, Friday, the Sunday night service doing, a, doing his testimony, and he's here as part of a group from Turkey. It's kind of a reconciliation group between two cultures, the Turkish and the Armenian culture. It's pastors from both sides, um, and they are here visiting uh, Fresno area, and so one of them is going to come Sunday night, give his testimony. That, so that should be pretty interesting, um, being a pastor in a, a culture like Turkey. So come along to that if you're interested in hearing that, and... Um, and just hearing uh, Steve preach. So today we're talking about fear. Four letter word, fear. Small word, but big emotions. And I'll start off with a quick story about fear. A young couple, very much in love, were getting married in the church. However, Sue, the wife, was very nervous about the big occasion. So the pastor chose one verse that he felt would be of great encouragement to her. 1 John 4.18 and it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. But rather unwisely, the pastor decided to ask the best man to read it and say that the pastor felt this was a very appropriate verse for Sue and that he would be preaching on it later in the service. However, the best man was not a church-going man, and he did not know the difference between John's gospel and the first letter of John. So he introduced his reading by saying that the pastor felt this was a very good verse for Sue, but he read John 4.18, which said, you have five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. <laughs> so fear can be defined as the absence of faith, or at least placing your faith in a series of what-ifs. Perhaps you remember Moses and the burning bush. Moses was raised up in Egypt, and at one point he saw an Egyptian god beating an Israelite. So he ended up killing the Egyptian god, and then he fled. And at some point, standed up ending, or ended up standing in front of a burning bush, talking to God. A bush that was burning, but not being consumed. And then in Exodus 3, God kind of lays out his plan for Moses. But right at the beginning of Exodus 4, Moses responds with a what if. What if they don't believe me? I mean, it was quite a big plan, and Moses was a wanted man in Egypt, so there was kind of a lot of fearfulness in the what if. But God convinced him otherwise, and Moses did it. So we look at the subject of fear because there are so many references to fear in the scripture. It's said that there's 365 references to the expression in one form or another, fear not or do not be afraid. That's one for every day of the year. So every day of the year we could read a passage related to God's message to not be afraid. But why is that important in our world? What's the point in reading about fear every day? Do we really live in that kind of fear in this society? Maybe we don't feel like we live in the kind of fear that they see in other countries. But according to the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health, there's a lot of people in fear in this country, and this was done last year on September 4th. Because they say the percentage of things that we fear that will ultimately never take place is 60%. So 60% of the things we are fearful of never even take place in the end anyway. And the percentage of things that we, are fear, that we fear that are considered to be generally insignificant to our lives is 90%. And then the percentage of things that we fear in relation to our health that are not really anything to fear is 88%. And that's not a terribly surprising number because health is one of the biggest fears that people have. But then, sorry, <laughs> amen. <laughs> the number of Americans who actually diagnose with a phobia, and these are actually diagnosed, a lot of people have phobias, but diagnosis of a phobia is different. 6.3 million Americans. So we're going to talk about some of the top 10 phobias that people have. Anyone want to know what the first one? Anyone know what the first one is, the top one? 
speaking in public, what I'm doing right now. Doesn't mean I'm not afraid of it, but I'm doing it anyway. It's called trusting God. <laughs> public speaking is also known as glossophobia. It probably comes from some Greek word somewhere, but 74%, three quarters of the population do not want to speak in public or are afraid to do it. 68% have a fear of death. 31% have a fear of spiders. I, I actually thought that would be higher, but. Fear of darkness, 11%. Heights, 10%. Social situations, 8%. And I won't ask, put your hand up for that because you probably won't. <laughs> Flying, 6.5%. Confined spaces or claustrophobia, 25 then the opposite, open spaces, 2.2%. Then the last one on the list of 10 is the fear of thunder and lightning, or brontophobia, as it's called. 2% are afraid of thunder and lightning. I think there's probably more than that, but I think most people realize that it's unfounded unless you happen to be standing in the middle of a field with an umbrella. And then <clears throat> so for the, for the most part, there isn't much reason for the fears that we have I mean, think about the one-third of the population that are afraid of spiders. That's a little irrational if you really sit down and think about it. If you consider the actual number of spiders that can hurt you in any major way, it's a very small amount of spiders based on the population here in the US. Um, I also find it interesting that out of the top 10, spiders is the only animal in there. And I think that's because we're in the US. I think if we were in Australia, I'm pretty sure that this would be full of a lot of different types of animals because I'm convinced that Australia is one of the most dangerous places in the world when it comes to wildlife. I've never been there, but I hear that there's some really gnarly stuff over there. <laughs> Snakes, for a start, would be pretty heavy on the list. They have ocean crocodiles in Australia. So you go to the beach, there's crocodiles. Anyway. One that isn't on the list that's a little more abstract is the na uh, is, is fear of the unknown. And we see that a lot in that show, you remember Fear Factor? And they had a particular game where the contestants had to put their hand inside a box, feel what was in the box, and then describe what it is. If they got it right, they get points. Well, this was a real problem for a lot of contestants. They could not do it. So despite the fact they're on a TV show where obviously the safeguards, they're not going to have them put a hand in there and something's going to bite it off or anything serious like that, or they're going to get poisoned, their mind really started playing tricks on them. So despite all the safety measures, they just couldn't do it. I saw another video of a blindfolded man and all he had to do was reach inside a box and take the item out of the box. And he just couldn't do it. He was just completely losing it. He would put his hand in a little bit, he'd feel something touch him and he'd just go nuts. And he went on, he never managed to do it. And the, the item inside the box was a teddy bear. That's how bad. <laughs> So we feel great fear when there's no reason to, or we just don't know what's ahead. Sleepless nights are often caused by the fear of not knowing what's going to happen. It's strange how three in the morning, all the fears and the things that we worry about seem much bigger and much scarier than they do in the morning in the, in the light of day. But fear also moves us. Fear is used by people that have a platform to help us, help move us in the direction that they want us to go. Fear sells. Look at newspaper and, and uh, TV ratings for news shows. Advertising is just a form of fear-mongering. The pharmaceutical companies recently have been particularly bad with this. GlaxoSmithKline's whooping cough vaccine ad portrays a sick grandmother as a wolf as she held an instant infant grandchild. Then there's Novartis, the heart failure awareness ads that show a room filling with water as an unsuspecting man calmly sits reading the newspaper. And more recently, Myelin and Pfizer have jumped into the mix with anaphylaxis and meningitis B ads. They both feature stricken teens who end up in the hospital. A Harvard marketing instructor, David Ropiak, said, fear has been built into the advertising of any company that sells us something that we need to keep us safe. He said he recalls a TV commercial for batteries that showed a mother losing her child in the park. But then she turns on a located device with the trusty batteries inside and finds the wandering child immediately. 
That spot was a 2008 ad for Duracell and is widely criticized for preying on parents' fears. Fear also wins political contests. How many times do we see the ads showing what would happen if their opponent got into office, all the doom and gloom filmed in black and white just to make it seem even worse? And fear is used by parents. All of us as parents are guilty of this. If you don't do as you're told, you'll get into trouble, instilling fear in our children. Well, it doesn't work all the time. <laughs> fear can be used to manipulate people, and there doesn't always have to be a lot of substance behind it. There was a professional thief whose name stirred fear as the desert wind stirs tumbleweeds. He terrorized the Wells Fargo stage line for 13 years, roaring like a tornado in and out of the Sierra Nevadas, spooking even the most rugged frontiersmen. In journals from San Francisco to New York, his name became synonymous with the danger of the frontier. And during his reign of terror between 1875 and 1883, he's credited with stealing the bags and the breath away from 29 different stagecoach crews. And he did it all without firing a shot. His weapon was his reputation. His ammunition was intimidation. A hood hid his face, and no victim ever saw him. No artist ever sketched his features, no sheriff ever tracked his trail, and he never fired a shot or took a hostage. Because he didn't have to. His very presence was enough to paralyze with fear. His name was Black Bart, the hooded bandit armed with a deadly weapon. And what was his deadly weapon? Fear. Fear has prevented many Christians from experiencing the blissful happiness that Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes. Their fear of death, fear of failure, fear of tomorrow, and the list goes on and on. Fear's goal is created to scare a joyless soul out of us, or create a joyless soul in us. It wants us to take our eyes off the peak and live in the dull flatlands of life. And Black Bart, Turns out he wasn't anything to be afraid of either. When the hood came off, he was no, there was nothing to fear. The authorities tracked down the thief finally. And they didn't find a bloodthirsty bandit from Death Valley. They found a mild-mannered druggist from Decatur, Illinois. The man, the pictures, the man that the newspaper pictured storming across on a horse through the mountains was in reality so afraid of horses that he used to ride a buggy between his robberies. He was Charles E. Bowles, the bandit who never once fired a shot. And why? Because he never once loaded his weapon. So what does this all mean for a Christian? We live in a society where this is manipulating us to be fearful, to be worried about things that don't really matter. How can we possibly live in this culture without it bringing us down? How do we overcome all this fear? But before we look at that, let's start by examining, is there a good kind of fear? Is there a healthy fear in our lives? Fear sometimes can drive us to do useful things. If we wake up in the morning with severe chest pains, the fear of that will make us go to the hospital or call an ambulance. That's a healthy fear. But if we go on WebMD every time we have every small pain, every small pain and conclude that we have some terminal illness that we really don't, every single time, this can be an unhealthy fear. If we work hard in our jobs because we have a fear of losing our jobs, that's a healthy fear. But that sometimes can turn into excessive competitiveness, undermining coworkers, and a complete paranoia that our boss doesn't like us. This can turn into an unhealthy fear. But there is an ultimate rational fear, the fear of God. And this isn't the start to some sermon about fire and tempest. However, as is much the case with the Bible, we only hear about what is a portion of the story. Fear is desirable to God, but it's just one half of it. Jeremiah 5.22 says, Should you not fear me, declares the Lord? Should you not tremble in my presence? Psalm 2.11 says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Psalm 19.9 says, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. 
Psalm 33, 8. Let all the world fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. But the other side of the fear of God is the love of God. Because fear is only beginning of the understanding. Because how can we possibly comprehend the incredibly great news of Jesus Christ if we don't first appreciate a fear of God? Without total awe, without wonder, without terror, dread, reverence, and respect for a perfectly holy, righteous creator. Without that understanding, how can we appreciate what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did for us? And it ultimately comes down to two things, perspective and per position. Who is God and what is our perspective on his nature, our perspective on his power and his justice? And then who are we and what is our position relative to this almighty God? So once we understand and accept the entire story, we can walk around in our lives with a special appreciation for two coexisting truths, the fear of God and the love of God. Psalm 118.4 says, let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. Psalm 147.11 says, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. And then finally, Proverbs 19.23 says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouchable by trouble. So we can see that a fear of God, a healthy fear, provides life, security, protection, happiness, confidence, satisfaction. So we can look at God with reverence, with respect, and an awe. We can seek to understand the sheer scale of God. Because it's really hard for us to do this. It's hard in our small communities and sitting in this small church to engage the absolute greatness and the strength of God. And he's not just a God of this world, he's a God of the whole universe. It's positively mind-blowing when you really try and get your head around it. But what it does do is help us to realize that there's a tremendous and unimaginable power. And yes, we should have a healthy fear of that because it creates a healthy respect of God. But the vast majority of what we worry about, what we fear on a daily basis, is generally irrational, irrelevant, or in some cases, completely stifling. Irrational fear can be summed up in the acronym FEAR, F-E-A-R. False evidence appears real. False evidence appears real. It's a clown car coming in. <laughs> so off we go in our lives with a healthy fear, a love of God as well. But combating fear on a daily basis can be tough. We're riddled with fears and worries in this modern day. So let's look at some things that can help us deal with some of these often paralyzing fears and thoughts. The first one is scripture. We're back to those 365 fear nots or do not be afraid. Though many of these also come with amazing promises that God's, God gives us. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So the promises that God gives us through saying fear not there is that he will strengthen us, help us. Matthew 10, 29 through 31 says, We are not, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value th than many sparrows. So the promise there is that we are of great value to God. So should, we should not fear. As we grow in our faith, we acknowledge the truth behind these words. We understand that these are not empty promises by God, but they're genuine because God gives them to, to us himself. With time, we begin to understand how to hand to God our fears, but that takes a little work to get there. The work is through handling his word. We have to know where to find the encouragement in scriptures. 
All of these references to not being afraid should be at our fingertips or even in our mind. Memorization for such an occasion for when we need it. And the reason for Bible study and verse memorization is so that we can find these things when we need them. They have an uncanny way of popping into our head just at the time we need them if they're in there. But we need to have them in there. We need to have the catalog because God needs resources to put in front of us just when we most need it. The second thing we should do is seek out God. God provides the Holy Spirit if you look to God for help. There's so much courage that comes from knowing that God will be right there with you if you allow him to be. Often we find this a hard thing to do because we know we have a much better solution. The problem is that our solution often consists of sleepless nights, cold sweats, exaggerated consequences in our own minds. So this isn't really a solution. This is very counterproductive. And what this does for us is it imprisons us, puts us in a perpetual state of worry. It creates a rift between us and God. Because what we say at that point is God can't handle this, only we can. This is too big for anyone to shoulder except me. But think back to what I said earlier. We frequently underestimate the awe-inspiring power of God. What could we possibly do that would be better than what God could do? God has no fear. Why should he? A mother of a four and a four-year-old were preparing to go to bed for the night. The child was afraid of the dark, and the mother, just on this occasion, was alone with her child because the husband was traveling. So she was a little fearful too. When the light was out, the child caught a glimpse of the moon outside the window. Mommy, she said, is the moon God's light? Yes, said the mother, enjoying her daughter's observation. Her next question was, will God put out the light when he goes to sleep? The mother replied, no, my child, God never goes to sleep. Then out of the simplicity of the child's faith, she said something which also gave great reassurance to the fearful mother. Well, she said, as long as God is awake, there's no point in both of us staying awake. <laughs> so how do we seek out God's spirit? Well, we ask him. It's that simple. Prayer is a powerful thing. God knows what's in our minds, but he wants us to tell them to him. He wants to hear it from us directly. He wants us to reach out to him and ask him for the burden of fear to be lifted. And when we put into words what we want God to take from us, he will listen. Earlier this year, I went through some hard months. And at times, I was fearful of what the future held. I prayed. I trusted God for the outcome, and it changed my whole perspective. It changed my ability to handle things, as well as providing me with clarity that could easily be clouded when you're living in fear. Fear produces tunnel vision, and God can provide clarity for us when we ask for it. If we confess to God that we cannot do it alone, he'll help us. A young boy was trying desperately to fix his broken bicycle, and he was getting frustrated as nothing he did seemed to work. Finally, he throws down his tools and storms off. His father, who was watching him, asked what the problem was. I'm trying to fix my bike and nothing's working. I've tried everything. His father looked at him confused and he said, have you asked for my help? Well, no, replied the boy. Well, then you haven't tried everything. God wants us to ask him for help. Just as like our children ask us for help, we want to help. Psalm 34, 4 says, and this is David writing, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivers me from all my fears. 365 times in the Bible it says, fear not. So do you think God is trying to tell us something? The fact is, God doesn't really want us to live in fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, the New King James Version says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. In Galatians 5, Paul lists the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
peace is on the lift, list. The absence of turmoil. Fear is definitely turmoil in our own minds. If we seek God, though, shouldn't we actually trust God? We should trust the outcome that God wants to give us. It's one thing to go to God, but then to ignore the answer is, then you might as well not bother going in the first place. So this is the third thing. So first, turn to Scripture. Second, seek out God. Third, trust God with the outcome. There may well be a good reason to fear, fear, fear certain things. And sometimes the things that we're dreading actually happen. But God is, help, is there to help us. He's there to lighten the pressure, to share the burden, to get us through it. When you have this knowledge, things don't seem quite as frightening after all. The thing is that fearing something will happen doesn't stop it happening. Fearing something's going to happen doesn't make it happen any more than it would. The outcome doesn't change at all through fear. So not only is living in fear paralyzing and a clouded way to live, but it's absolutely pointless. I know it seems blunt, but if you think back to statistics, we start learning that 60% of things that we fear are never even going to happen. 60%. Most of these are created by what if scenarios. And there's a, there's a kid's book called Emily Grace and the What Ifs. And this is a story about nighttime fears for kids. And one of them in there is what if a big rhinoceros charges out through my closet door, pulls off my covers, and I catch cold and catch pneumonia? <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but I think some of the what ifs that we come up with are probably even worse than that. So that's just one example of nighttime fears of a child. But what it ends with is, what if I just close my eyes and go to sleep? So how about if we take a lesson from that and say, what if I just trust God with the outcome and find peace? So here's an important point about what ifs. These scenarios that we play around in our minds tend to be fears that we value the most. Chris Beale, the pastor in Texas, hit it right on the head when he said, <clears throat> what you fear the most reveals what you value the most. When I became a father, I realized that the most distracting fears that I had were about something happening to my children. I'd find myself thinking these what ifs a lot. That's because I value and love my children a lot. If we have fears about marriage, that means we value our spouse. If we have fears about our job, it means we value our job. And these are all good things, right? We need to value these things. We should value our children, our spouse, our jobs, anything like that in life. But here's the other side of that. What we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. So what we fear the most reveals what we value the most, but also what we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. Think about that for a second. What comes to mind? What comes into your head? Children? An aging parent? Your health? Write it down. Write it down on a piece of paper just so you can see it. Because if you can't begin to trust God with something, you need to know what it is first. You need to know what to trust God with. You need to be able to figure it out, and then once you do, that's the first step on the path to freedom from it. In order to defeat, defeat something, you actually have to define it. So what do you do once you've written it down? Well, share it with someone, and that's the scary part. Share it with a spouse, a friend, or even a small group. Because once you write something down and you share it, it's very hard to ignore it at that point. It becomes very real. A small group's a perfect environment for that kind of thing, or it should be. A small group to sit around should not be in judgment. At least that's the way it's supposed to work. I don't know how all the small groups work. But once you acknowledge that fear and you choose to trust God anyway, no matter what, and we acknowledge it to God, because guess what? God already knows. He's just waiting for us to catch up a little bit because we're a little slow sometimes. 
So what we need to do is hand it to him and just stop spinning our wheels because we're not getting anywhere with it. It doesn't change the outcome. In scripture, we read about David, who was selected by God to be the anointed king of Israel after Saul. But the anointing was basically done and Saul was still king. So it was a little preemptive. Saul finds out about this. He's kind of mad about it. So he hit, takes out a hit on David. David flees and spends literally years on the run from Saul and his army. So I think that probably qualifies as a life of fear. But what does David do in this situation? Well, in Psalm 56, 2 through 4, we say, My adversaries, my adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. In God I trust and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? In God I trust and I'm not afraid. In God we trust. Does that sound familiar? I know some of you have big wads of cash in your pocket. Pull out the cash. Take a look. Capital letters. In God we trust. But do we? It's on our money. That makes it some kind of national motto. In fact, in 1956, Dwight Eisenhower actually signed the law officially declaring in God we trust as the nation's official motto. So in God we trust is the country's official motto, yet so many, so many of us find reasons not to do it. So many reasons to keep all of the really important stuff to ourselves so that we can take care of it and we throw all the small stuff to God. The other important statistic that we looked at was 90% of the fear, things that we fear are considered to be insignificant to our lives. Insignificant to the person that's worrying about it. 90%, that's almost all of them. So that's stuff that may be in our lives, but it's just not even significant to what we're doing. The only significance that it has in our lives is what we give it, we feed it. So those seem to be the easy ones to just pluck out of our mind and throw away. Sometimes it takes a kind of triage approach to fear. We feel all these fearful emotions, and what we really need to do is sit down and figure out which ones are valid. Sometimes some are reasonable, and sometimes some do relate to our lives and are, are relevant. But we also need to figure out which ones are just a series of what-ifs that have got worse and worse in our mind, and which ones are just completely irrelevant but at the time we were thinking them, they seemed reasonable. So we could sort through all this mess and decide what we want to do. We take the ones that are genuine fears, or we consider to be genuine fears, and we seek out God and we give them to him. Because he wants to take them. And then we take all the others and we throw them away, and we don't revisit them again. John Wesley had a couple of things that he had to say about fear. And the first one relates to the fact that in our lives we glance at God and we fix our eyes on the problems. And our problems are usually our fears. But we should fix our eyes on God and just glance at our fears. He also said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up kingdom of heaven on earth. But before we wrap up, I want to address one of the fears that's it's on the list, but I think it's more common than people will admit. And that's the fear of death. What will happen to me after I die? It's a very legitimate question. Because each of us have sinned. And we distance ourselves from God through sin. And we worry that that sin is going to have some effect on our eternal life. Even if we've given our lives to Christ, we have some fear in us that what we do now is going to create a rift between us and God and ruin what we already had. So we fear the consequences of what happens after we leave this earth. But the good news is that while we as the sinning people were busy sinning, along came Jesus Christ. And he took all of the sin. We have no separation from God because of our sin if we ask for forgiveness. James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary on Romans, tells the story of a young Russian, the son of a close friend of Tsar Nicholas. 
and he was caught stealing from the Tsar. As a treasurer of a border fortress of the Russian army, the young man was to manage the Tsar's money and dispense wages to the troops. But he began gambling and trying to cover his losses by borrowing from the army treasury. One day he heard that a government auditor was coming to examine the books. So he sat down, added up all that he had taken, and it was a huge amount. He emptied out all his own resources, subtracted that from what should have been in the account, and he noted the great discrepancy. And under the amount due, he just wrote, a great debt. Who can pay? Question mark. He couldn't, and he didn't know anyone else that could, so he drew his revolver, and he decided to kill himself at midnight. But as he waited for the clock to strike, he fell asleep, and while he slept, Tsar Nicholas paid a surprise visit. He saw the books, he saw the despairing note and the revolver, and he realized what the young man had done and what he was planning to do. But rather than arrest the young man, he had mercy on him. He stooped and wrote something next to the man's note, and he quietly left. When the young man awoke, he again picked up the gun and was going to pull the trigger when he noticed something. Next to his note, a great debt, who can pay? There was a single word, Nicholas. The next morning, a bag of coins arrived at Nicholas, from Nicholas that covered the exact amount that was owed. Jesus covered our great debt. Who can pay? Jesus. The debt that we create when we withhold our fears from God's hand. God sent Jesus down to earth to be with us, to live a sinless life, to be tortured and put to death for sins that he didn't commit. It wasn't his great debt, but he died for the sins that we commit. God did this because he values us, because he loves us, and he wants us to trust him. Because what we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you give us the opportunity to unload our fears onto you. That you take that seriously, Lord, that you take them from us because you want them. You want us to live in peace. Not that troubled things won't happen to us, but that we can deal with them in a way where you can unburden us so that we can live richly in the joy that you gave us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the ability to not be distanced through sin from you, but to be able to ask for forgiveness through him. Lord, we just pray that we take advantage of this and that we feel a need to share our fears with you instead of keeping them to ourselves and understand that we cannot take on more than you can. There's just no way. We thank you for all this, Lord, and we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great day, everybody.